Hello everybody and welcome back to the next episode of Caverns of the Snow Witch. In the last episode we killed the Snow Witch and we are now escaping through her illusion tunnels with our friend the elf and the dwarf we rescued. Um, so, the dwarf laughs to himself and walks towards the wall, you following behind. Walking through the illusion, you find yourself in a narrow, torchlit tunnel, which you walk down in single file. It soon ends at a junction, and you discuss which way to turn. Now, I'm just going to double check. Did I bookmark this last session? Uh, 171. I did. Let's go left. Why not? As you walk along, the elf introduces himself. My name is Red Swift, and he is known as Stop, he says, pointing to the smiling dwarf. We met here as slaves in the service of the vile Snow Witch. We both now hope to return to our villages. I live in the Moonstone Hills, and Stub comes from Stonebridge. If we manage to escape from these infernal caverns, you are more than welcome to come and stay with us. Stonebridge is on the way to my village in the hills. It's also a long way off. Before Red Swift can continue, Stub shouts and points to an orb lying on the ground. It is made of glass, and in the torchlight it seems to glow with swelling colours. Leave it, commands Red Swift. We do not need it, and it could be a trap. Well, we'll chuck down a bookmark, and we'll pick it up. When you pick it up, the orb starts to get warmer, and its colours change rapidly and swirl around. Red Swift and Stuff back away, telling you to put it down. We'll, we'll bookmark again, and we'll keep hold of it. Determined to discover the secret of the orb, you hold it in your outstretched hands. The warmth starts to creep up your arms, and soon you are all you are glowing all over and feeling warmer than you have been for weeks. You gain three stamina points and one luck. You assure Red Swift and Stub that this orb of energy will warm them too, and they nervously pass it between them. Oh, well that was a good thing, eh? After walking for another five minutes, the tunnel turns sharply right and right again a few metres further on. Right, so we turn left. Placed against the left-hand wall of the tunnel, there is a large iron casket with a brass handle in the shape of a servant. Wow. Stub draws the short straw and reaches for the handle, cursing his luck. As soon as he touches it, it comes alive. An asp curls itself around his left uh, his hand, and before he can shake it off, it sinks its poisonous fangs into his wrist. He falls onto his knees, clutching his wrist with his other hand. Red Swift quickly draws off the poison with his knife. Luckily, the dwarf has a strong constitution, and he soon recovers enough strength to continue. I'm bookmarking that, because that was a lucky, lucky selection, I think. The tunnel soon ends at a T-junction, stepping into the cross passage, you almost bump into a primitive looking man wearing furs and carrying a large stone club. Nom. <laughs> okay, so the other two have run off. I'm not going to run from this fight. I will keep going. Okay, defeated. A star-shaped metal disc. I'll bookmark that as well, that could be really good. The tunnel ends at a door which swings open before you even touch it. You look into the... Two, wh wait, what? Okay. Um, it's Red Swift and Stubber kneeling in submission to a horror of a creature with an octopus like head. There's an amulet of courage.
Yeah, I'm still alive after you just did that. You wake to find Red Swift and Stub lying unconscious on the floor, but there is no sign of the brain slayer. You groan as you try to sit up, but the pain in your head is almost unbearable. They explain that the brain slayer drew them into the cavern and they were powerless to resist. You examine the chamber and see another door opposite in the far wall. There are also two clay pots in recess in the wall, one red and one grey. Well, I will look at the red one. Sure, we're looking at the one. And we'll put up, and we'll break it and read it. Oh, okay. Before the writing fades away, you learn a spell which will protect you against an attack by an air elemental. I gave one luck, and the words Gulsang Abidar. Oh, definitely bookmarking that. <laughs> the door opens into yet another tunnel, and you begin to wonder whether you will ever find your way out of the caverns of the Snow Witch. You look at Red Swift and Stub, but they do not appear to be very concerned. The tunnel suit ends at another door, and you notice a dagger sticking out of the oak paneling. Well, we'll bookmark, and we'll pull the dagger off. Oh, when you pull the dagger off the door, it suddenly takes a woman with its own involuntary you stab. You start to stab your own leg with the wild dagger in your hand. Well, okay, let's, let's scroll back, and let's not do that. So we open the door. I'm not hungry. After resting for half an hour, you set off again, and eventually the tunnel ends at a T junction. We'll put mark, and we'll go left. Take the shield. Put mark again. Take the shield. As soon as she touches the shield, a howling wind starts to blow down the tunnel towards you, almost knocking the three of you off your feet. Taking the shield has unleashed the fury of an air elemental. Fortunately, you remember the words of the scroll and utter them as the elemental draws near. It disappears as quickly as it appeared, and all is calm again. Well, I did it. <laughs> The tunnel ends at another door. An old piece of parchment is pinned on it. There is fading writing on the parchment, but you do not understand the language. Knowing that elves speak many languages, you ask Red Swift to try and read it. As he reads, his eyes widen with terror. You ask him what is wrong, but he refuses to reply. He rips the parchment off the door and tears it into tiny pieces. He turns the door handle and says, Let's get going. There is no time to lose. You and Stubb just look at each other and shrug your shoulders, deciding simply to obey the trouble Red Swift. The door opens into another tunnel. After walking down it for a few meters, you come to a place where water is dripping down continuously from stalactites, uh, stalactites overhead. But Mark, I have a shield. The water looks harmless enough, but you do not wish to get cold and wet. You place the shield over your head and walk under the gentle waterfall. I throw it back and help everyone else. The tunnel runs straight on until it opens out into a cavern. The walls are covered with ice and a large glass globe stands on an ice plinth in the centre. Suddenly an orc runs into the cavern from the tunnel opposite and the globe immediately starts to radiate light. The outline of a face takes shape in the globe, one which you recognise. The Snow Witch. Her encased head starts to laugh, and then you hear her speak. In a chilling voice, she says, Although you killed me, you have not defeated me. My spirit can still defeat you. Watch carefully. The orc who is standing by the globe grips the metal collar around his neck and cries out gasping for breath. His face bulges as he desperately tries to stop the collar tightening. His efforts are futile, and soon he, f he soon falls silently to the floor. 
Snow Witch's image sneers contemptuously and says, I have no use for servants any longer, and I know that two of you are still wearing my obedience collars. I will enjoy watching you die next. You refuse to watch Red Swift and Stop Die helplessly, and you rack the brain to think of a way. Oh, do I have... I still have one iron ball. Oh my gosh, hang on. Uh, bookmark. Let's sling it. What's my skill? Okay, so I hit it. I got lucky. I quickly dived. As you try to stand up, the Snow Witch concentrates her powers on Red Swift and Stub. Their metal collars tighten and they both clutch their throats as if gasping for breath. You struggle to your feet, yelling insults at the Snow Witch, mocking her cowardly way of dealing with defenseless slaves. You challenge her to a combat of whatever type she wishes. She laughs, saying, Even though I have beaten you, I enjoy games. I will play. She releases her strangled hold over Red Swift and Stub, and they fall silent to the floor. Suddenly you hear the sound of shuffling footsteps coming from the tunnel opposite. An elf and a dwarf enter the cavern. They look almost identical to Red Swift and Stub, except that their vacant looks and putrid white flesh indicate that they are both zombies. So much tells you to fight them while she invents a game for you to play. The zombies lumber forward and you are forced to fight the terrible replicas of your friends. Bookmark! I guess I have to fight them. You are not getting a six, mate. No. I say, so no sixes. Okay, now go face the elf zombie. No sixes for our place. One last hit is all I need. Okay. Oh. Okay, but mark this. The Snow Witch looks surprised and displeased by the defeat of her zombies. She suddenly, she says, The game we are going to play is called Discs. <laughs> you will not win, of course, but in the unlikely event that you do, I will give you the chance to escape. I hope you have remembered to bring along your discs. Without them, you lose. She laughs sadistically at the thought of making up the rules on the spur of the moment. Nevertheless, you must play as directed. So we do have the discs. Another one. The Snow Witch quickly explains the rules. She tells you to choose a disc and conceal it. She will not. She will then call out a shape. A square beats a circle. A circle beats a star. And a star beats a square. If you win, you'll be given the chance to escape. If you lose, you will die. If you choose the same. Both choose the same save. You will play a game. I don't have all three discs, so star. Oh, wow. Well, I died instantly. Um, so it's not star we want to conceal. What about square? Oh, so which stares at you, 
for some time before calling out Circle. You smile and unfold your clenched fist, revealing the square metal disc. You are aware of her and she realises the consequences. The globe starts to fill with white smoke and suddenly it shatters. The image of the snow witch disappears. Her shrill cry fills the cavern, but she is defeated. The three of you slap each other's hands in celebration. However, your joy is short lived as you hear an ominous rumbling. The ground beneath your feet starts to tremble and huge cracks appear in the ice walls. The roof starts to cave in. Is this the chance to escape that the snow witch promised? Oh my luck. I'm lucky. By some miracle, you are not hit by the heavy chunks of falling ice. When they finally stop crashing around you, you were surprised to see the welcome sight of blue sky above. <laughs> the three of you waste no time clambering out of the ice cavern, and you find yourselves on the side of the mountain. It is not even snowing and everything looks tranquil. As you climb down the mountain, you tell your friends about Jim, Big Jim Sun and the circumstances that led you to enter the caverns of the snow witch. You realise that Big Jim would have presumed you were dead. You decide it's not worth chasing after him to collect a reward for killing the Yeti. I want my 50 gold! Thank you very much! Look at this! 50 gold! That's why I only took 150. So I go to Stonebridge. Your journey south is long and arduous, but your determination to leave Icefinger Mountains behind you spurs you on. Two days after leaving the ice cavern, you reach the River Cock. Fifteen miles up river lies Fang, the town where Baron Sukumvit's Sukum notorious death trap dungeon awaits its challenges each year for the trial of champions. However, at this time of year, Fang is unlikely to be more interesting than any other river town. You decide against going there and walk down river to find a bridge or boatman. After walking for half an hour along the bank of the wide, dirty brown river, you see a man asleep aboard a raft moored to the bank. He tells you to go away as he is too tired to work today. Huh. I'm going to keep walking and see what happens. Further along, you find a small wooden boat tied to a tree. You look around, but you cannot see its owner. Wait for the owner. Oh dear. Feeling tired after the strain of recent events, you sit down and rest. Stubb decides to go off to forage for food, and Red Swift begins to make a fire. You drift off into a deep sleep which your body welcomes. You gain two stamina points. You are woken up an hour later by the ringing sound of clashing swords. You leap up and see Red Swift engaged in combat with somebody wearing a hooded black cloak. When he turns, you realise he is a dark elf, the natural enemy of Red Swift and his friend, fellow wood elves. You run to help your friend, but you are not needed. With a forward thrust of his sword, Red Swift dispatches his adversary. Whose idea was it to wait for the boatman? Asked Red Swift with a wry smile. Refusing to be baited, she suggests that you search through the belongings of the Dark Elf. A pouch on his belt contains a glass vial filled with a green liquid. Red Swift takes out the stopper and sniffs it, but he doesn't recognise the smell. I'm going to pour it on the ground. Okay, we're going to go back. Actually, no we're not. It is not long before Stubb returns, laden with nuts, roots, greens and a fat rabbit. Using a pan he found in the bottom of the boat, he sets about making a delicious stew. While Red Swift brags about his fight with the Dark Elf, soon you are all enjoying the nourishing meal, telling each other stories and putting the terrible memories of the Snow Witch out of your minds. You gain four stamina points. Really? Well, I'm at max already. Later, you climb into the Dark Elf's boat and push off from the bank. It does not take long to reach the other side, and you set off south across the Pagan Plain for Stonebridge.
Marching quickly across the plain, you do not encounter any evil quit, uh, creatures. To the east, you see the forbidding shape of the fire top mountain reaching into the sky. Does the warlock still rule the depths of fire top mountain? Starlock asked inquisitively. You are just about to reply when you see somebody walking towards you. You draw your sword, but when the person gets closer, you see that there's a little armed man carrying a sack over his shoulder. He stops in front of you and says, put that sword away. There is no point in fighting. The only thing I have to offer is information and that costs money. Well, I'll bookmark and I'll take your information, old man. After putting the coins, coins carefully into a hidden pocket, the man tells you to be careful two things if you are travelling south to Stonebridge. Firstly, the nearest water hole has been poisoned, and secondly, there are a lot of hill trolls gathering to the north. He bids you good luck and farewell, and walks off. Stubb urges you to set off as quickly as possible, worried about the possible attack on Stonebridge by the hill trolls. The flatness of the plane becomes monotonous. And you forget to keep a constant lookout. The reflection of the sun in your armour has attracted a group of flying predators that do not notice that you do not notice circling above you. They are humanoid in shape with large wings, and they swoop down on their prey to kill them with their sharp claws. There are four of these birdmen above you, and one of them suddenly lets out a shrill cry and swoops down to attack you. What luck have I got? Nine. Well let's see, I was happy. Well I am. You just manage to draw your sword in time to defend yourself against the dying birdman. He veers away slightly, but turns to attack again. He's got a high skill, what the hell? Yeah! No. Wow. There, oh. I can't beat this guy. Amazing. Simply amazing. No, I literally cannot beat this guy. No matter what, he will always. Oh my lord, okay. I rerolled! Well, what I think we'll do, we have it saved it to, we got a 256. Hang on, there we are. Let me just find it so I know we can go back to it. Uh, this one? Yeah. Okay, so we have to... We'll do that all again next time, and we will defeat the Birdman. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you enjoyed, and maybe leave a comment of how you think we're doing. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.